fact, read out by Adam, and we will do our best, although I will do little because I'm going to try and keep them in order, to provide answers and informed comment. Now, if those answers and informed comments fail to satisfy you, you can, if you wish, make your own comments. The only thing is we probably shall take no notice of them and won't listen to them and won't record them. But we will, however, try to be rational. If you have uh, some comment to make as a result of what we have said, perhaps you would put that in writing to give to Adam so that it can actually be done in some sort of organized way because we can't be flashing backwards and forwards from one side to the other. It just won't work like that. What we will do is to start with the questions as read out by Adam. I will pass them about on the table and we'll just see what comes of it. So if you're ready, Adam, we'll have the first one. Uh, the first question comes from Colin Washington. Did the Golden Dawn actually create the pentagram rituals or was there anything uh, similar in continental magical lodges at, at the time? Stephen, perhaps you'd like to take that up. <laughs> That's the chairman's privilege. Okay, well, my answer to that would be that I personally don't know for sure, but I would have thought that um, the pentagram ritual as such was originated at the Golden Dawn. Um, does anybody know to the contrary? Alec? I, I would agree myself. I'll pass it to Alec. A gentleman called Mr. Gerald Suster attacked my book two or three years ago at the behest of Israel Regardi and said I got it all wrong. And in fact, the Golden Dawn was quite uh, wonderful because where else before Mathers produced it could you find the banishing ritual of the pentagram? I didn't know. Frankly, I didn't mind. And he said, too, that he'd done the banishing ritual of the pentagram daily for ten minutes before or after breakfast. It done him the world of good, and he recommended me to do the same. I think we can proceed to the next question. And the next question comes from uh, Reggie. Very simple question. Um, can the panel uh, tell us a possible foundation date for the Golden Dawn, founding of the Golden Dawn? And I stress possible foundation date, whether administrative or ritually um, started, and a possible foundation time for that meeting. I, I will take this. I cannot tell you the time, but I'm going to use my crib sheet <laughs> and tell you the date, which... I, I think one can safely say that the, the establishment was in February of 1888. We know that the ideas were being developed in the previous year. We don't know precise dates in 1887, except that I, my own guess is it's the second half of the year. Certainly by December of 1887, everything was organized. By January 1888 the pledge forms and everything else were printed in the cycle-styled form, and the earliest signatures are on the 12th of February, 1888. So at some time on February the 12th next, you can all sing hallelujah because you'll know that's the real centenary. <laughs> if you wanted to do a, a horary figure... Uh, we'll have to do some more researching, but I believe Alec is capable of doing that because if he doesn't know, he will call it up on the astral plane. <laughs> do you want to do a horoscope? Yes. I'm sorry, I, I can't yes, help he you. Does. <laughs> uh, my question is um, astrological correspondences with the Golden Dawn system. I mean, the rulership, the, the traditional rulership of um, astrology from Ptolemy onwards seems to have some discrepancies with the ones of the Golden Dawn, like the moon ruling air, which we all know the moon does affect water. Um, so I'd like to know if any of you has any, um, anything to say on that. Well, I will immediately pass the buck again because I don't profess to know anything about astrology. Now, now which of us does? 
Stephen. <laughs> Unfortunately, I've forgotten all I know about astrology. <laughs> uh, if there's anybody, this is the point at which we can say if anyone here is able to answer that, because it's a straightforward factual question, I mean, please do so. If you can't immediately, but if you go away and find the answer or can think it up, I mean, please do communicate with everyone else through Adam, um, and it can appear, if necessary, via the Hermetic Journal. I can add um, a little bit to that in indirect answer to your question. Uh, attributions to, say, the geomantic figures of uh, astrological um, images. There have been three, four, or even five different traditional descriptions throughout history. Um, it's hard to pin down which is the correct one. Uh, I came down to the conclusion that one had to just say there were four main systems of doing it. I know you're not asking me about geomancy, you're asking about uh, uh, planet uh, versus element, but the same thing applies. And I think that in the last analysis, Mathers settled on, one of his uh, co-workers settled on one set of ascriptions, possibly for no better reason than that was the, what they thought was the most authoritative text. Well, I think you had an answer to the previous person's question. This young lady was asking uh, the Golden Dawn had an attribution for air to the sphere of the moon um, and why it contradicted some of the traditional uh, attributions in the uh, more ancient manuscripts. One of the reasons was that the uh, Golden Dawn used the sphere of the moon to uh, represent Yesid and used it in their elemental initiations. Um, in the uh, diagram of Malkuth, the elements are opposed. Malkuth would represent four quarters, fire, water, air, and earth. If you projected those into the spheres of the lower triad on the tree of life, you'd have Yesod as air, uh, Hod as fire, Netzach as water, and Malkuth as earth. So the uh, initiation for the uh, sphere of Yesod would correspond to the element the elements would be on opposite sides of the cross. Those people who are in, in the actual symbolism of the rituals themselves and will find that the color schemes are quite consistent from grade to grade. But one thing that I noticed uh, in, in my studies of the rituals themselves was the inner sash leading from the neophyte grade to the philosopher's grade, that the actual color symbols of the the paths and the crosses that appear on the sash don't seem to bear any resemblance to any known system of correspondence. I wondered if the panel could throw any light on the symbolism of those particular colors and why they were chosen for those grades. I always understood that the, the correspondences were Kabbalistically based on, on one of the four scales, the four color scales, but I haven't tried to analyze which or why. I don't know if anybody else here has. It looks like this is the kind of thing that requires further investigation, and it's the sort of thing that justifies further research into the order. I suspect they were not chosen at random. I suspect they had very good reasons for it, but they haven't necessarily left a record, at least one that, not one that's been found yet, as to why this was done. This is something that yet requires further work. Well, I have two questions. My first question is, did uh, Elias Ashmole play any role at all in the development of Enochian magic? And, uh, of course, he was also a, a mason. But in his diaries, a reference to his initiation to a Masonic lodge. And my second question is, at the time of the formation of the Golden Dawn, 1888, did female co-masonry exist? And were any of the female members of the Golden Dawn members uh, of this uh, female Freemasonry? Well, that's a, a multifaceted question. Um, if we start with Elias Ashmole, um, whether he was Enochian or not, I don't have any evidence that he was. Perhaps you've come across it, Stephen? Yes, I can, I can do that one. Um, Elias Ashmole was, uh, some of you might know, probably responsible for saving a lot of Dee's papers. Uh, he was born, I think, eight or nine years after Dee died. Uh, realized that there was some real value in the magical work that Dee was doing and set about borrowing his manuscripts from other collections like the collection of Thomas Cotton and painstakingly transcribing them. 
Um, interestingly enough, earlier today, somebody mentioned to me that Ashmal had translated his manuscripts, uh, these manuscripts, that is. In fact, he simply transcribed them. The originals were in English and some Latin. Ashmal's copies were in English and some Latin. Um, he actually worked the system uh, in some of his own diaries. There are details of the workings that he did. Uh, what's more, he bequeathed his library, which included these manuscripts, to uh, both Oxford and London, and so the manuscripts have survived down today into the uh, Sloan collection and also the Bodleian collection in Oxford. So he was quite instrumental in, in uh, saving the manuscripts. One notable, notable batch of manuscripts were locked in the bottom of a secret drawer in a chest of olive wood, which Dee used on his travels around Europe. Um, when Dee's estate was sold up, this was bought by, um, I think, a Mr. Whale, or somebody else that fell into Mr. Whale's hands eventually. During the Great Fire of London, uh, or was it just before the Great Fire of London anyway, in the 1660s, uh, they discovered that the bottom of the chest had a secret drawer, sprung it open, and out came a large number of manuscripts. I think it's amazing today to think that you might have had a piece of furniture for 30 or 40 years containing... Uh, literally pounds uh, in weight of paper and not noticed it, but I suppose furniture in those days was very heavy. At any rate, that particular bunch of manuscripts was used as uh, fire lighters for six months, which is quite a lot of paper, and what is left fell into Ashmole's hands, and that is a considerable part of the D corpus. Now, Ashmole had some other interesting connections. One was that uh, he was involved in heraldry, um, was offered the position of Garter King of Arms at one stage and was instrumental in the founding of the Order of the Garter. He also wrote one of the uh, standard works on, uh, on arms. Uh, that doesn't really connect him with his magical interests, I suppose, but uh, you could say that it, it is him that has allowed Dee's work to pass on into later generations and hence to the, uh, to the Golden Dawn. I think that answers it adequately insofar as we're talking about the Enochian side of it. Now, the, the question as to whether he was a Freemason, of course, is fairly easy, and I'll ask John to answer that. Um, it's very easy. He was. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, he is the first record that we have of... Um, what we would call a speculative mason rather than someone as happened in the operative lodges in Scotland joining the lodge as an honorary member rather like um, a member of the local gentry would join a local society as patron. Well, no doubt about it, I mean, Elias Ashmo was. It's recorded, his initiation is recorded in his diary and a further visit to a lodge at the Mason's Hall um, in the 1680s, if my memory goes. Yeah. <clears throat> there was, of course, a third part of the question as to the existence of, of what is now known as co-masonry, that is the existence of female lodges, at the time that the Golden Dawn was founded. Now, that, I would argue, is debatable. To the best of my knowledge, in its modern form, there were no co-masonic lodges in 1888. I think I'm right. Yeah. The female members thus did not join or had not previously joined any lodges of this sort, but certainly later, by the early 1900s, when, when co-masonry did exist in this country, a good many of the lady members joined it. Uh, the, the specific details can be found by examining the um, co-masonic journals at the time. We unfortunately do appear to have attracted a few Abramelin demons to ourselves. <laughs> This is unfortunate, but such things cannot be avoided. Um, what I would like to do is, is to ask Marsha if she could say anything about female membership of these precursors to the Golden Dawn, because it's a field in which she has been working. Perhaps you could comment on this. There were, in, in France, from uh, in this, even in the 1740s with the Order of the Mopses and things, there were kind of obscure little mushroom lodges that where ladies were admitted. And then in the 1780s, female Freemasonry is quite a powerful organization, quite often the working with the Grand Orient Lodges in France. These French Freemasons who came to London and who were instrumental in establishing the Swedenborg Society did admit women to their lodges. 
Uh, and in some of the journals of the time, there are kind of great polemical battles about how the regular Freemasons, and I have to always make this distinction, had missed the boat because they didn't let women in their lodges, whereas the Illuminés Theosophs, who were the French Swedenborgian lodges, who did have English members, did allow women in. So it's had a long history. As I say, what's interesting is we you know, go round and round and we find that they all invented it a long time ago and we all reinvent the wheel. I don't know. Yeah, this is something I think that yeah. requires examination. We do have the list of members of Ahatua Lodge and it could be cross-checked against members of the, the various French Comasonic Lodges. This has not been done. If anyone cares to do it, the list is printed in here and it can be followed <laughs> up. You can borrow it from the library. You don't have to buy it. <laughs> I, one last point, I would say, if, if either of these two parts of the same incarnation can describe what may or may not have happened in female masonry in, say, the second half of the 19th century in England, um, we can quickly move on to the next question. As far as I'm aware, co-masonry, um, as we would understand it, didn't arrive in England until 1902. In fact, when the Golden Dawn was founded, it was only just getting started in France. Um, so I don't think there's much chance of any of the ladies having, certainly the English members, um, unless they spend a fair amount of time in France having been co-Masons. And it wasn't certainly until, I think it was 1902, the first lodge was introduced into London. Okay, next question. Coming back to the question that you didn't answer earlier, Bob, um, the Golden Dawn is mentioned quite explicitly in its Hebrew reform by Gustav Meyrink in his book The Golem, uh, in the, the passage given to Hillel in Kabbalistic terms. Was Meyrink's link uh, any more substantial through the um, Easteric Lodge of the Blue Star in Prague, or did he glean his information through published sources? I have no reason to suppose he had any direct link. Now, I don't know if anyone else of the panel can add to that or if not anyone else among you who can. I mean, we have no evidence for it. If anyone can recommend a source where we can find it or, or add to it, please speak up. Answers in the negative, I think one can assume we have enough gathered wisdom that one can assume he didn't. Okay, Martin Short. I mean, his lecture was about fringe masonry and, um, and the Golden Dawn, and to a large extent he answered the question which I wanted to ask, which was the connection between regular... Freemasonry in the Golden Dawn, uh, but there still remains one conundrum in my mind, which is whether Alistair Crowley was actually ever a member, either an initiate or a joiner of English regular uh, Freemasonry. In his, in his autobiography, he says that he was, but uh, that is no reason to believe that it was true. <laughs> well, I think that, in a sense, answers itself. Uh, <laughs> I would pass it to John for a definitive answer. Um, no, it's, it's quite true. Um, as far as can be established from the various tracks that Crowley laid down, he got his 33rd degree from a spurious, um, unrecognized Supreme Council in Mexico. <clears throat> <laughs> He then came back to Europe and he joined a lodge called the Anglo-Saxon Lodge in Paris, which was working under the Grand Lodge of France, which is again an irregular body, which is not recognized by regular Freemasonry. Um, he claimed to have attended a meeting at Freemasons Hall in London. Um, whether that claim could ever be substantiated at this distance, I don't know. Um, he attempted to join the Royal Arch in England and um, was written to by the Grand Secretary of the time saying that as he was a member of an irregular lodge, um, there was no way he could join English regular Freemasonry. There's, there's no trace of him in the records at all. Sorry? Do you want, Do you want the next question? Yes, if you like. Okay, it's this pink one. It hasn't got a name on it. Does anybody recognize it? <laughs> well, actually, I must say that I formulated this question before Ms. Shurak's lecture. Um, well, basically, I'd just like to say that, that it's probably irrelevant now. Um, a couple of speakers have perhaps irrelevantly attacked the works of Nesta Webster, although to be accurate, she attributed the behind-the-scenes influence on the Russian Revolution to Martinist and Memphis Mizraim groups rather than to Rosicrucian ones. And it has to be admitted and that 
a lot of her work has been partially vindicated by Michael Billington's book, Fire in the Minds of Men. But the question is, actually takes this form. Is it not a fact that several magical groups today are quite openly um, attempting by various means to influence political decisions and our states of mind? And if magic can't change our world, what use is it? Well, the, the last part I will leave till last. Um, perhaps, <laughs> perhaps you could elaborate a little by... Give him back the microphone, he's going to need it. <laughs> you stated that certain groups, I mean, this is exactly the kind of thing Nesta Webster said. Which groups do you have in mind? Perhaps well, you could tell us. Yes, but actually, I said that the, the, the basic part of the question was um, if it is not licit to say that magical groups are changing the world ah, I'm in sorry, any way, I misheard. Why, what use is magic? Um, I think, in a sense, that. A, I do not believe there are any known groups either attempting to or succeeding in influencing politics or whatever. I th and the Lucis Trust? Um, Wickens? Uh, you would... I must say, I was... I was thinking in terms... When you used the word licit, I must admit I was transmuting that into the word rational. <laughs> <laughs> that, I admit, was a mistake. Having said that, I would say you then come to the question of what is the use of magic if it cannot transform the body politic. It can transform human behavior. There is no question of that. You have seen innocent, law-abiding citizens turn into raving maniacs less than half an hour ago. <laughs> Undoubtedly, there are other uses of magic. There are other purposes of magic. I would suggest, if I may, I will take our panel one by one and ask them to answer that, either in the affirmative or the negative, if in the affirmative, to give us their reasons and what it is they think magic influences or succeeds in doing. John, I'll start with you. <laughs> Simple answer. I don't think it does. That's one to the nose. <laughs> Eric will answer... And I will comment on his answer. I think it does. I'm not prepared to tell you why or how. <laughs> <laughs> I, he's actually done what I hoped he would do. You see, I imagined he would probably say no, and then I would say he is forbidden by his own magical order to tell you the real reasons. <laughs> he has effectively said that. Um, if that doesn't apply to him, it certainly applies to me. <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, I will, however, pass since it's got to me. I don't entirely like the use of the word magic. Now, if you expand it and say whether ritually based esoteric groups of, of whatever kind achieve anything at all, I don't think they do in the body politic. I am quite sure they do on a personal level. Uh, whether for good or ill depends on the group and on the individual. But I think this can come about. That is a purely personal opinion. I can't really say any more about it, but I will now pass you on to Marsha, who is, besides being the grand mistress, is, is a great magician in her own right, I'm sure. <laughs> um, I find the question quite peculiarly English, uh, because <laughs> in England, where there is a great tradition of encouraging individual eccentricity, there's great distrust of group eccentricity. Uh, versus the, the Americans who don't like individual eccentrics, but we don't mind anyone joining any religious cult, church, Freemasonry, anything else. And it's kind of more power to them in a great, you know, the great stew that we live in of all of our weird religions, social organizations, elks, moose, everything else. So the question is interesting to me here because I think it's a question of whether religion, prayer, anything else has any effect on reality. And there you divide into believers and non-believers. On it. That would be my answer to it. Okay, the, um, the first point, which wasn't asked to answer, <laughs> I can think of several groups which actually have amongst their avowed intentions changing the body politic. Whether they do it or not, I have no opinion. Uh, the second part of the question, yes, I'm sure magic does affect change, not just according to Crowley's definition, but generally. We've had today uh, and yesterday uh, lectures pointing to changes in literature, even rock music brought about indirectly by the Golden Dawn. Uh, much more concrete examples, personal experience spring to my mind. Yes, I'm definitely sure that magic does cause either one-to-one -one changes at a personal level, 
changes at a group working level. Changes at a national and political level, I'm not sure of. May I suggest then, with, with, uh, other than points of factual information, uh, on this question, say, of, of the effects of magic, may we go through the others and then come back to that, because I think it's the type of discussion that is likely to, to, to wander a little. Um, that's no disrespect to those who wish to speak at all. It's just that I'm, I'm trying to see how we can accommodate the other questions as well, if we may have the next one. A question from Chris Williams. This is partially relevant to the previous questions. It's two parts. How many groups do the panel know are working the Golden Dawn system today? I don't necessarily mean the one we saw just now. And the other part is, have the panel found any part of the Golden Dawn system more effective than any other section? For example, did Mr. Skinner only work the Econochian system and neglect the other parts of it, like the tarot? And how valid is it to take just one section of the Golden Dawn system? Well, I think, again, we'll have to run through that. Um, on a personal level, I think I certainly know of two groups who attempt to practice the straight Golden Dawn rituals. Um, however, I must say that since they both... I'm not a member of either, so I can say this quite openly. Uh, they do not wish themselves to be identified. They don't tout for members. Now, they are not in any sense either political, religious, Masonic, or anything else. They are small groups of people who happen to believe that working some of these rituals benefits them. They do it on a purely personal level. They don't try to proselytize. They don't try to claim they have an unbroken apostolic succession from the old Golden Dawn. They just are people who found these things, think they're of value, and work them. Um, I can't even say that I can pass your name on if you wish to join. I can't do that. I don't really know them well enough. As to whether one should separate parts of the, the system from any other parts, this really is a question of saying, can you separate occultism into its relevant parts? In, in terms of interest in it, I would say yes. I, for example, have no interest in astrology, and yet I'm certainly interested in the Kabbalah. So I think one can separate it. Whether it's a question of saying on a practical level you could work the whole system by splitting it up, I just don't know. I will pass that to the, the panel and start if I may with Stephen. Okay. Um, the sort of personal question there was, have I only practiced the Nokian system in the Golden Dawn? And the answer is no. I have worked my way through a lot of the Golden Dawn material. Um, I wouldn't attempt to do one part with exclusion of the rest, but I don't see why I shouldn't have. Uh, one could quite easily just work a purely Kabbalistic system and ignore the Enochian accretions. Like Bob, I'm not very interested in astrology. I find it a chore when I have to do astrological calculations to find out the most appropriate ritual times. That is a bore. Um, I think that you could look upon magic in the same way as you look upon science. It might be useful to know chemistry if you're a geologist, but it's not essential. You can always go and have a quick crib in a chemistry takes to check something up. Same thing applies to magic. No comment? Ellie. No comment. Well, you have the three <laughs> secret unknown superiors with nothing to say. Um, oh, on the matter of number of groups. Oh, yeah, we can turn to another comment from Steve. Sorry. Over the last ten years, I know of five groups here and two in the States which have worked the Golden Dawn system and uh, one potential one in France um, how many of those are still going with the same rush of enthusiasm that they started with, I can't be sure. Fine. The next question, if we may. My crib notes. Uh, it's Chris Morgan. Uh, I better come clean and say that I am also a member of the VOTO, um, although I choose to sort of make my point in a more civil way, I think. Um, personally, I must say going by the talk that you had on Freemasonry, I would not want to be associated with Freemasonry in Britain today. And I thought that some of Eric Howe's attacks and some of the other speakers' attacks on Crowley and on the OTO was a bit of the pot calling the kettle black. Um, what, if you like, my question is, is would the panel, especially the members of the Freemasonic orders, not concede that it is possible to make serious criticisms of Freemasonry in Britain that do not depend upon saying that it's controlled by the KGB, 
but depend on other things to do with the establishment nature of Freemasonry and the effect, usually of a sort of detrimental thing, I would say, that Freemasonry is alleged to sort of do in this country. And I think you were very defensive in your remarks, but you ought to go on and actually defend yourself, if you like, properly against the charge. So at least concede that there's reason for concern about what Freemasonry is up to in this country. Um, that, if you like, is my question. Uh, well, again, I would say I don't agree that there's anything either disreputable or that needs defending in modern Freemasonry. It is very much a social organization. It's not political in any sense. But I think the best thing is to turn to John, who is in a better position than any of us, to answer this. Um, I uh, agree with you certainly on, on that, Bob. Um, I'll also go back to what you said a moment ago when the um, question came from over the other side about groups working today. Um, you said which groups. Um, a lot of accusations are thrown at Freemasonry, um, usually very vague, um, usually the sort of accusations that can't be tested um, either one way or the other. Um, <coughs> I think there is a great deal of public misconception about Freemasonry, which can probably be laid at Freemasonry's door itself because it's been very inward looking for about the last 30 or 40 years. Um, whether because there is a public misconception, therefore what the public misconception is, is right, is a much greater argument which I certainly wouldn't support. Would any of the others care to add to that? Does that satisfactorily answer the point you raised, or would you like to come back on it? But I think as well you could say something. I mean, all right, I didn't spell it out, but personally I found it quite offensive all the way through this conference, the way such a great figure as Alistair Crowley has been lampooned, right? Even though I think we probably wouldn't even be in this hall if it wasn't for the work of Alistair Crowley. And also the uh, factual mistakes that were stated about the OTO, which uh, your information, Alec Howe, is not just something centred in New York is something that has branches all over the world, including branches in the UK. Um, and I state that as a member of the OTO. Again, I think there's this... Oh, I'll come to it in a minute. Just initially, I would say that over the question of, of, of lampooning Crowley, I don't think he'd mind in the slightest, for one thing. On another, I don't think what we have said, any of us, in factual terms about the, the life and career, and it, we haven't really touched upon it to any great extent, has been inaccurate. I would stand by everything I've said relevant to him. I don't think it's an unjustified attack. I think it's just a fair comment. And I just, uh, just as anyone is entitled to comment on another person in terms of their writing and their career, as to the existence of OTO branches in England and elsewhere, I just don't have the factual information. I don't dispute it exists in England. Um, I have no knowledge of its membership, so I can't comment on that. As to the question of exposing or otherwise the social structure of the membership of Freemasonry, it is a, a private society in the sense that I don't think individual members object to saying who they are, but it's there's hardly, to my mind, a justification for releasing long lists of people who are members any more than you would say releasing lists of members who are in anything else, largely because for other societies, say tennis clubs or golf clubs, it would just be too boring. <laughs> in, in the question of Freemasonry, because it's seen as something secret and terrible by a certain proportion of, of the population, there may be some force to saying it, it ought to be more exposed, but I don't see how it can be without intruding on people's private lives. Now, I don't know if John would care to add to that. No, I'd, I'd agree exactly with what he said. Um, the comments that I, I would like to pick up from the original question, which was reiterated um, in the follow-up to it, um, about Freemasonry being an establishment organization, um, <laughs> As the librarian of United Brand Lodge, I do a lot of traveling around to um, talk to lodges around the country. Um, nothing could be further than, um, further from an establishment organization. And you, you literally, um, it's in fact one of the nice things about my job, I meet such a wide cross-section of the population um, from all parts of society um, who all happily meet together. Would you care to come back on the OTO? Yes, you know, it seems to me as if the speaker was objecting 
to the fact that the identity, uh, is it that the, the Freemasons keep themselves secret? Was it that? I'm sorry. Am I, I'm not lampooning anybody at the moment. You, you were arguing about this question of identity, weren't you? That's two ways of uh, history. We've had over this weekend very much the descriptive uh, part of history, which is simply saying what happened, you know, who wrote what to whom, and who proposed what chapter. I'm rather interested in the lessons of history and the effects that sort of thing happened, and particularly the practical effects that um, magical rituals like those practiced by the Golden Dawn may have had, notab notably in bringing uh, to the fore um, forces, whether you call them angel angels or archetypes of the subconscious, which the practitioners were not actually initially set out uh, to contact. For instance, we have the fact, which was told, that the initial founders of the Golden Dawn regarded themselves as a rather esoteric branch of Christianity. In other words, they were definitely pro-Christian. Uh, yet today, uh, the most the successor organization uh, with the greatest membership, at least most in public view, which is the OTO, is overtly pagan. And even the more conservative uh, offshoot, the Society of the Inner Light, which, which regards as Christianity more or less uh, a condition of a mem membership, I mean, that went through the filiation of Dan Fortune, who wrote the, um, who wrote the Sea Priestess, which also had the sort of strong pagan element. Then there's the, uh, the case of uh, Dr. D, who, much to his surprise and shock, uh, told angels talking to him about the daughters of the, was it daughters of the earth, or something like that, plus angels uh, later telling him to do some, some wife swapping. And of course, we have uh, throughout history, like this, uh, this sort of magic which starts in a sort of patriarchal mode, yet already at the time of the late 18th century, we have in, uh, the um, Mozart opera, uh, in which you have the, um, this rather ambiguous figure of the Queen of the Night. Um, so, apart from Crowley, who says that he had the, um, this vision of Awas, when he wasn't in the least bit interested in paganism, he was trying to cultivate Buddhism, and Dr. John Dee, are there any other records of people uh, changing their views as a result of rituals which they practiced. And this goes both to the panel from the historical point of view and to anybody in the audience from the practical sort of working magic point of view. Well, if I, I may start briefly, I think it's unquestionably a fact that whereas the Golden Dawn started out, if not as an overtly Christian body. It expected one to be sympathetic to Christianity. That's true enough. Equally, I think Mathers, to start with, uh, turned away from Christianity. He, he wished to be very much in the hermetic mold rather than the Rosicrucian mold. That is, he wished to become God, effectively, in some form, whatever that might mean. Now, I'm sure that of the members, some went one way, some went another. No one was then or is now ordered or impelled to believe any one particular system, the fact that they may have drifted to paganism or may have come in from paganism to some form of Christianity is really a matter of their personal taste. Now, to what extent the Golden Dawn split down Christian and non-Christian lines, I think is arguable. It could be seen, for example, that in 1903, Waite's faction was Christian and, and Falcon's was not. But this would not be true. It would be an inaccurate representation. Some people in each faction would have held beliefs which were highly unorthodox and which didn't fit any form of Christianity and may be looked upon as pagan. But again, I think this is a matter of their personal taste. As to the question of the historical effect of ritual magic, I think I will ask my two colleagues here, starting with Stephen, as to whether you can shed light on it. Right. If I can talk, first of all, from a practical point of view rather than historic, I think that... If you consider magic to be simply working with the contents of your own subconscious mind, then indeed you might be surprised if uh, being a Christian you've got pagan imagery or pagan results or vice versa. But if you consider magic to be something uh, real that brings works to a certain extent with external or at least fairly far removed intelligences and forces, 
then I don't see why anyone should be surprised to get what they weren't expecting. That doesn't really answer the question, but... Uh... Uh, I will ask Marcia, in her researches, she's found anyone among the people she's been investigating in the 18th century who appear to have drifted from Christianity into paganism as a result of their practices. They've drifted into eclecticism, I think, mainly, as they enlarge the range of things that they know about different religions, etc. And uh, certainly most would try to bring it into a Christian framework, but this, this became quite a large framework that contained many, you know, many, what the, the mansion has many rooms in it. Um, you rarely find in the 18th century, or really well into the 19th century, uh, an out, a, a real atheist. They may have been it privately, but you almost never find anyone who would say they were in public or in writing, etc. So that, you know, what people did with it nearly always had to fit within a Christian framework, including these very, very interesting small Jewish lodges that tried to have a kind of via uh, media between uh, Christianity and Judaism without giving up the religions uh, through uh, Jewish mysticism, a kind of Christian Kabbalism. Uh, I think that's important. I think any ritual, any teaching that affects the mind and the way people think, whether it's psychoanalysis or uh, deconstruction literary criti criticism, which is real kiss of death, if you ever have to read that, or um, mesmerism or any of these rituals, will obviously have effects if the people are in positions of influence, like Lafayette trying to get George Washington to mesmerize the troops at La Valley Forge. You know, he thought the revolution could be won without a fight if everyone went into a trance at the same time. <laughs> you know? um, so. I think to, to think of it as being mysterious and magical depends mainly on whether you believe in a world of spirits or whether you believe that these are projections of a mind, whether you're a materialist or a spiritualist. Most of these questions break down. But certainly, depending on the people who get interested, they can have a tremendous effect on politics, economics, university teaching, etc. Yeah, you know, more power to them. Uh, maybe I may give an answer of the question what's going on by working with magic, uh, which came from another gentleman time before. Uh, it could be another side of it, uh, even it's not new. Uh, that's uh, each time by working with magical rituals, it's a, wor uh, it's a working with, um, well, an archetypical powers which are lying in the common, sub uh, common sub uh, subconsciousness. Uh, you must, um, well, sorry, I come from Germany, so I have some difficulties to explain well, what I want to say. Very well. And, um, well, working by these archetypical powers which are lying on, in this uh, common subconsciousness, which is called for astro state or astro plan too, uh, will awake these archetypical uh, powers uh, when, uh, well, maybe when I, they are sleeping or not, because they off very often or any time are people working by that uh, by their own fantasy and so on. But it's just uh, a question: how strong is that? Is a psychical energy? they uh, put into this subconsciousness, this common subconsciousness, and the connection to the common subconsciousness is the own um, personally subconsciousness. So each time if uh, somebody is working with that, there will be a moving in this uh, a pro, let's say, a progress or proceed, well, uh, in this uh, plane, uh, not in this plan, I'm sorry, in the state, the common subconsciousness and the results which uh, will be given of that are the reflections in the own mind. So let's say for, a pe for somebody who hasn't any knowledge but will prove, uh, improves any rituals or another things, so re the reflections are another, uh, well, as uh, by an... Uh, mm, let's say, by a magician who has a big knowledge, who is working a long time with that, and uh, will get better results because his reflections are more clear. Okay? Thank you.
Uh, this question relates to magic groups causing a change in the world. Um, since it seems that uh, there's a, a similarity between at least part of the Golden Dawn Adeptus Minor degree and the Masonic uh, Rose Croix degree, and since we seem to agree that the Adeptus Minor is a, at least some form of magic, couldn't we agree that masonry is, in some sense, a form of magic causing changes in, in the candidate, one would hope? And if so, uh, can we agree from that that masonry as a magical order is causing a, a change in the world, hopefully for the better? Before I pass this over, I would say that as a matter of information, that one must remember that in this country, we don't have the ancient and accepted right in the same way as it exists in America. And consequently, the craft degrees are what most Masons will take. They will not progress into the ancient and accepted right. So the, the vast majority will not be familiar with this. As to whether that is, that is similar to the Adeptus Minor grade, I don't think it is at all. I think in a sense that it uses the symbolism of the rose and the cross, you have a vague analogy, but it's so far adrift that I just don't think one can honestly compare them. The question as to whether one can look upon masonry as in any sense magical, I will do a bit of buck passing and pass that to John. Um, I certainly agree with what Bob said. I also agree with what Marsha said, that any, anyone who practices any sort of ritual is bound to have some sort of effect on them. Um, there's obviously no point in doing a ritual if it doesn't. It just becomes empty performance. I can certainly see no connection at all between the two rituals that you mention. Um, I can certainly see nothing magical in um, any of the Masonic rituals I've gone through. Um, a lot of practical things, a lot of um, common good sense, a lot of philosophizing but nothing that would be recognized as, in quotes, magical, which goes, I think, through most of the Masonic orders which are practiced in this country. I think I'm a member of all but two of them. I can't think of any correspondence at all. Sorry. No, I thought I already had. I, I, I have read both of them, and I mean, there are odd similarities, but then you pick up any two books, there are going to be odd similarities. You know, you, you can't just take little bits out of a context. A ritual is a ritual as a whole. If you start taking bits out of one and comparing them with bits from another and then saying, well, because they both exist in both, um, therefore there must be a similarity between the two things, um, you're going off into what in history is conspiracy. <laughs> well, I had just you've, one you've, you've got to consider the ritual as a whole, not just all little bits of it. I'll add one last comment, if I may. Those of you who may happen to be Anglicans or be familiar with the Anglican Church will possibly have noticed some vague similarities between the alternative service book and Christianity. <laughs> but I think that's enough to show that similarities exist in everything. If we could have the next question. I, I would just come back on two things on that. Um, necessarily someone following Islam will not agree with Christian beliefs except in certain essentials. Um, so it's impossible really to, to start fighting with one faith against another. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just saying that necessarily if one is a Christian one cannot agree with everything in Islam and vice versa. I'm not saying one should condemn people for one belief or the other but just accept that they are different. I would also say that I could not stress more strongly that I don't personally and I think this is generally held to be so believe that in any sense can Freemasonry be considered to be either anti-Christian or in any sense hostile to Christianity in any of its aspects. I think you'd agree. Yes, if, if, if anything it's a, it is a great supporter of religion and not just Christianity one of the, the, basic, the basic qualification for joining Freemasonry is that um, the candidate must have a belief in a supreme being. Um, how he expresses that belief is entirely up to him and it is not a question which will be gone into with him. It can't have escaped. I think many people's notices that over the last two, three years there have been quite a number of attacks from various um, churches on Freemasonry, both in this country and 
growing in the United States, mainly from the fundamentalist evangelical churches in the United States, simply because of this business of Freemasonry, A, not being in a religion in itself, and B, um, refusing to be involved in religious squabbles, religious differences. Um, I think Marsha would bear me out on that one. We had a, uh, an interesting talk with an evangelical in this country who totally condemned Freemasonry uh, because nowhere in the rituals is the name of Christ mentioned. And when we pointed out to her, well, the, the simple reason for that is, A, we're not a religion, B, we're not a branch of the Christian church, and C, we have a lot of members who are not Christian, who if we gave a, a prayer, which a meeting usually begins with a prayer like a lot of, um, it, it's a sort of historical carry-on when Freemasonry was developing, everything you did, you started off with a prayer. This, this, this is continued in Freemasonry, rather like as in Parliament, they start each session with a prayer, the Boy Scouts start with a prayer, this sort of thing. If the prayer that is used at the beginning of a meeting, if we ended up in the, with the usual Christian ending of, of being in the name of Jesus Christ, um, you would upset a large proportion of the, the, the people who are Freemasons because they are not Christians. Oh, yes, Marshall. I think what's, this is to several of the questions that have come, that the publication of all the list of Freemasons would put everyone in a coma. It would be so boring. Because you're talking about a great mass of ordinary people who join a social fraternity that does a great deal of uh, charity work. I mean, this is what the view, and certainly in the United States, is where these kind of controversies just never take place in any large way about Freemasonry. But I think what is interesting to us, though, is that it's usually the fringe group who are quite creative, imaginative, the ones who paint great visionary paintings, who write wonderful poetry, who compose wonderful symphonies. They are out of the ordinary, and they... If they are Freemasons, they're looking for something in it with a great deal more talent and imagination and may run with the rite or ritual far beyond what the ordinary citizen who's in a kind of ethical social fraternity will. I mean, we always concentrate on the bizarre and the unusual because there are great talented artists and thinkers. But for the rest of us, you know, we are very, I mean, I'm not a Freemason, but it's a pedestrian or, you know, organization of ordinary citizens. And I think making an analogy with the Rotary Club, golf clubs, and Boy Scouts covers about 90% of the, me the membership. Sorry, I, I've, I've got lost. Where, where's the next question? Oh, um, Stephen, do add to that. I don't know if I heard you right, but it sounds as if you said that uh, magic was of relatively recent origins in the West. Uh, uh, I didn't tell uh, you, it obviously came across from that. What I said, that the uh, involvement in it, or the, the, the belief is that this, this is involved in a modern or a relatively new invention such as the country of the society. Ah, because I was going to uh, reply that I could trace it back, giving a chapter and reference right back to the Picatrix, back to Arab sources, and back down to not exactly the Koran, but at least the 9th century. Um, I think we better move on. I mean, it, it could obviously can be carried on, but it's not fair to sort of... We have a question take back directly to the Golden Dawn. We've been... We've really been dealing with things like Freemasonry, which is, in a yes, way, I... although there are some people on the, on the panel who are Freemasons, you know, that, that doesn't really matter. I mean, they're, they're, they're on the panel because they, they know about the Golden Dawn, basically. And, um, you know, that's good enough for me, really. I, never, I don't think of them as Freemasons. I just think of them as, as people of Britain, you know, on, on, base, on the Golden Dawn. So, I mean, I'd like really to... You know, this question can be followed up. The question of Freemasonry can be followed up elsewhere. But I mean, let's try and get back to some of the central questions. Do you, no? no. Do you, do you... I think that I have a question that encompasses what this gentleman had to say and also the Golden Dawn and the magical tradition in general. You had mentioned, Bob, I think twice in, in the proceedings that if we look back on the Hermetic tradition, the notion of man evolving it like a god. Uh, you identify that with hermetic tradition. And it seems to me there's sort of like two threads in Western magic. One is uh, humanity becoming godlike, increasing their powers of consciousness, taking on god forms and whatnot. 
and the other is what this gentleman is talking about is sort of doing that under auspices of a sort of a humility that greater creator that uh, man is not trying to equal and um, it seems with the golden dawn there were two things were kept in balance for a while and uh, Actually, I don't know if I have a question that leads to that. It was just sort of an observation that seemed to be sort of two threads. Uh, he was addressing one, but uh, there's both there in the tradition, it seems to me. If I might just make one brief comment on that, since it was basically itself a comment, is I think it would be fair to say that the, the Rosicrucian element, strictly as opposed to the Hermetic element, is not a magical part. It is not a magical tradition in the sense of working practical magic. That's my own personal view of it. And I, I think this was, this was expressed um, in a paper by Kathleen Rain, the Yeats, the Tower, and the Golden Dawn. And she made a comment, in the, she recorded a comment made by Gerald York in which he distinguished between the Hermetic and Rosicrucian traditions and made more or less that point, that the Hermetic magician wants to become God and then the Rosicrucian wishes to take God and Christ in particular as his exemplar, and it's not magical in that sense. If we could move on to the next one. <laughs> Again, I would say to call it magical is not strictly accurate. I would, they would, they were, well, there were regalia, if you like. There were appurtenances, but I don't think they became magical until Mathers decided they were. I have a question. Um, it stems from something that was shown last evening. Uh, in the slideshow, you showed a picture of um, a document, a second order obligation. The seal on the bottom of that document uh, appeared to me from where I was sitting um, to be a little curious. The lower half of the figure in the center of the seal appeared to be backward. Um, would this be so, or was it just an optical illusion? Uh, no, it, it's not an optical illusion. It is much to do with Victorian morality. It is a representation of a nude male, but it's a rather sort of amorphous male who appears to have no organ of generation. <laughs> yes, one question occurred to me yesterday, which I put down. I'm sorry, this, this comes under the heading of a simple question, which has a probably a very difficult answer, but I'll, why not have a go at it? And the question is, what, if any, practical use of Golden Dawn knowledge and material can safely and profitably be undertaken today? Oh, sorry, it's such a hard question, but can you have a go at it? <laughs> I'll pass the buck, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, do I take it the question you're asking is, uh, is it uh, worthwhile practicing Golden Dawn tradition magic today? Is that it? I would say yes. I would say it's a valid, valid technique. It's a good technique. It's worked. Um, it's not as practical nowadays to assemble as many people, perhaps, but the answer is still yes. Is that sufficient, or should we call upon the others to agree as well? <laughs> Do any of the other members of the panel disagree, I would say? It would be nice to feel we have someone who is horrified by the Golden Dawn. No, they do not. They are all good magicians. Carry on. Okay, I'd like to make a comment on both the Christian to pagan crossover and the political working. Um, I've noticed that working magic affects one's viewpoint as one discovers more. And the Christian dogma, especially in some of the fundamentalist sects like we have over in the U.S., can obstruct magical progress. What often happens is the belief of the individual is modified by a coming of understanding or by the individual themselves who discards a belief to get grow in knowledge. They cast aside unusable concepts, such as guilt and what I call sheepness, um, and be, tend to become a bit more eclectic, understanding other religions as well as the one, say, that they were raised in. With regard to working on politics, the 
whether it works or not question is that a large area of effect, which is what you have to deal with when you're working in the United States, is that it requires more effort on the part of those who would do it. And it would have to be uh, concerted and such like that. It, you reach a point of diminishing return unless you take a number of years and have a large number of people very well coordinated. And quite frankly, I think it's rather ludicrous to mess with the lives of an entire nation in some sort of uh, divine arrogance. Well, I would say we just have one short reply. Since that's American, I'll turn to Marsha. She can give us the American viewpoint very briefly. <laughs> I think there's so many influences working. And we, I mean, we are a country founded by dissenting sects, so every cockamamie religion in the world is, you know, quite happy there. Um, we have no established church, and there just isn't the sense of, of worrying about whether people in their church or their lodge or their moose club or their elks or their swanettes and their marching bands try to influence politics. It's kind of because it's so eclectic and pluralistic good. You know, and out of this will come some kind of ordinary consensus in some way. Now, we get some very weird politicians in office. You have to deal with that all the time. But I think the question about the power of different societies and, and et cetera in politics just doesn't come up in the same way because of not having an established church and not having the sense that, the, that heresy matters. I mean, we are a mess of heretics. That's what we all are over there. They are also, An odd answer. <laughs> they're also, of course, rebellious colonials, but we'll yes, leave that. <laughs> I'd like to know if either Mr. Skinner or Mr. Gilbert has made any practical use out of the Abramelin system of magic. Well, I can state categorically, no, I have not. Um, I don't know about Stephen. Well, I can say that I haven't worked the, the system through which one should do, because the system was derived, was set out in such a way that after the six months of effort, um, if you'd been truly um, dutiful and done it properly, your mind at least would have been fairly sharpened and focused at the end. But I can say that, uh, in my opinion, the Abramelin squares work um, in the same sense that other magical squares do, and I have taken, uh, shall I say, advantage of them once or twice. But I haven't worked the full system through much to my uh, own disappointment. This isn't a question as such, but just now a gentleman asked whether it was viable and practical to work the Golden Dawn rituals and traditions. Um, if we are to drop away from this um, general personal idea that we can all make up our minds about what's happening around us, and deal with the fact that there may be something real taking place, and I do mean in terms of personal and extra-personal forces, um, the gentleman's question might be answered by one particular event whereby at a certain point in time, the equinox of the gods took place. And there are a number of people present that are totally aware of Ferton, and to work Golden Dawn traditions now is a little bit like taking up um, Tati in the 20th century. If people are having difficulty working their rituals, it's because they have been defocused and depowered. They can be reanimated, but at this point in time, we're looking for something a little more dynamic. There are certain individuals that have developed these techniques as they've been vilified throughout their own lifetimes and even over this weekend. I would personally not subscribe to them. However, they have shown us a way whereby Actually, we've got to stop looking at traditions. Earlier on, the Freemasonry question came up, and it just struck me as sitting here as a member of the audience that we were talking about so many layers of spaghetti that where did we find the beginning and who sowed the first you know, bit of spaghetti? Going back to distant time, I just have one thought, and that's a Neanderthal man creeping out of a cave one day, looking up at the heavens and saying, where the hell am I? And you know, we've been doing it ever since. <laughs> now, this isn't a question. Now, the question here is really, we've now come back that we've gotten as far through our evolution to the golden dawn. And the people that subscribe to those principles, yes, they work for them, but maybe there's other systems that are working just as well. For that gentleman down there, 
According to one event in 1904, all rituals prior to that time are now null and void. The gentleman over here, who is a member of the OTO, would point out why. But as we're here talking about the Golden Dawn, I don't see any point in going on. If I may make a preliminary response to it, um, I think it, it's a reflection of the fact that different people wish to follow different traditions, different practices. I think what we have here anyway as the whole audience is a combination of people who are, some of whom are interested solely in historical and critical aspects, some of whom are interested solely in practical aspects and of what may have developed from the Golden Dawn, and I am still quite sure that much of the OTO system, as I understand it, does grow out organically from the Golden Dawn that went before it. And we have other people who are interested in both. So I think what we're trying to do is, is to encompass everything relating to the whole Golden Dawn system, what went before it, and what has come out from it. One other thing that I, so earlier on in one of the questions, I had a, a little image in my mind which your Neanderthal man reminded me of. There's a cartoon by Thurber in which he, he has his caveman and cavewoman, and the caveman is woken up by a terrible thunderstorm, and there, there's lightning flashing and great crashes of thunder, and they go away. And the caveman's wife, who's been asleep all through this, he, is suddenly woken up where he says, what was that, what was that? And she says, it is nothing. Go back to sleep. And he goes back to sleep thinking, she's wonderful, it doesn't bother her, she's a magician. And that's the original sort of female principle. <laughs> A question from uh, Ron Heisler. I'd like to ask a question which may um, catch all the panel unawares, but perhaps there's someone in the room who might know something about it. In recent years, the study of mysticism has developed considerably because very hard-nosed scientific work has been done on mystics, which in laboratory conditions, mystics have been subjected to measurement of electrical impulses and brain movements and so on. Has there been anything done in magical workings, either with the Golden Dawn techniques or with related or spin-off techniques, to try and measure results? Does anyone know of anything which could answer this particular point? I can't personally answer that. Can Stephen? Go ahead. The basic answer, I think, is no. I know that one of the better-known researchers in that field at one stage had it proposed to him that he did such measurements on a full goetic ritual. Um, I know that it never happened, but it was an interesting thought at the time. Uh, I think that most of the laboratory work is still um, is not focused on ritual magic yet. It's mostly confined to psychic experiments. Well, that seems to be the only answer we can come up with. If I just say a brief addition to what I said before. Uh, the whole question of the magic, its magical systems or another or more psychic experiments is a question of what is objective and what is subjective. And the question of objectivity will be always a point of discussion because it's just... Um, a change, exchange of subje uh, sub subjective, um, or subjective mansions. And, well, in the Golden Dawn system, for these who have uh, read something about that, uh, the rituals and so on, is an answer in this question. It is the answer of cups unpacked, or cogs unpacked, or light in extension. Thank you. <laughs> we, we now have unfortunately to draw to a close because in a very non-magical way the authorities who actually run this building can cry whatever the Latin is for let there be darkness and the lights will go out and we must go out with them I'm afraid but uh, I do trust that you have enjoyed this conference I would like to thank those on the panel and all the speakers we've had and all of you for asking questions offering opinions and I hope gaining something of benefit from what has been done. It has been suggested by one or two people that it would be rather nice to have other conferences sometime in the future taking up similar papers, similar themes. Now, that would not be possible on this sort of scale, but if those of you who are interested in, in making some sort of commitment to such a thing, either in terms of preparing papers, coming to it, 
paying for it, would care to let your names and addresses be known, uh, we will see what can be done. And if Adam would like to say some final concluding words that will send us off in a shower of glory, I will thank you. Well, after uh, the first um, few hours of the conference, when, which for me was a very busy time, I was rather exhausted with dealing with everybody in the first um, few hours. But after that, I began to relax a little and enjoy many of the speakers. We've had a very rich sequence of talks, and as most of the speakers knew of each other's work to some extent, things fitted together very well, but there was no overall plan, as it were, no overall interpretation that this conference was aiming at uh, laying on to the golden dawn. It was my idea as the director of the, of the trust that uh, allowed this to happen, um, it was my idea really to pursue the golden dawn as I, I pursued things through the Hermetic Journal basically bring together different viewpoints and let us all examine these and see what, what resonates with, with ourselves because we're not here to alter, change each other's viewpoints. I think the audience uh, for this um, conference has been extremely good and that has allowed the speakers um, to talk in depth about what they really understand and know. And you, if you have an audience which is um, knowledgeable, um, many of you in the audience, of course, have as much right to speak on the platform as, as these speakers here. And that's, that's been, for me, the value of, of this conference, bringing together a group of people and um, you know, sharing our concern for the, uh, what lived in the Golden Dawn and what can still live through it. And there are people still working with the system. And I think we've had a very harmonious um, uh, weekend really together. Uh, well, people in the audience, people who came to the conference have, have, have uh, shared ideas and been, had a sense of harmony. Uh, we've had some outside, <laughs> outside interference, but that was, <laughs> can't comment on that. I'll not be organizing another conference on this scale on, on, on the Golden Dawn. I, once in a lifetime is enough, really. Um, but I think we've brought together lots of different viewpoints. And we, we will preserve this in that we will take the talks that have been given and we'll put them in eventually into some kind of publication which will probably bring together some other material um, relevant to the Golden Dawn. And this will be, in a way, it will mark the 100th anniversary of the the conception of the Golden Dawn. So that will survive, hopefully, um, into the future. Thank you all for helping make the conference um, what it was.